Hey friends, welcome back to part two of the case study we've been working on for Bob and Sue. If you're watching this video for the first time and you haven't seen part one, be sure to go check that out. You can click right here and that's how you can go watch part one where we evaluated what the best social security options for them might be. In this video, I want to actually dive into what else we can do such as investment allocation, perhaps Roth conversions, um, different distribution strategies. What can we do to help optimize their plan any further? So after we concluded the last video, we determined that it's probably gonna be better for them to both delay their social security past 62 until uh, 67. So um, the next step is to say, what else can we do? So right here we can see this is what we determined based on our last, uh, where we stopped off and saying that social security, we're gonna take that at full retirement age now, which increases their probabilities of success by a little bit, but more importantly, it'll benefit them in, in any situation, most likely moving forward, even if they don't live to their expected uh, dates of death. Being Bob, actually, we had him passing away at 75, and that proved to be even more beneficial for them to take it at, um, at 67 rather than 62, even though he did pass away early. So. That's where we're at. Let's take a look at a couple things. Right now, their overall allocation in their portfolio is around 63% stock. Personally, I think that's a little bit low, um, just personal. Uh, so I want to kind of see, hey, what can we do to improve that? Or is there room to improve that? So right now we're at 67% probability of success. Let's bump that to like, I don't know, 70%, just increase it just a little bit and see if that helps us out at all. It actually bumps us up a decent amount, I would say, um, by increasing that little bit to the stock side to help give them more longevity moving forward in terms of long-term asset returns. I wonder if there's any break point here. What if we go to 80%? Helps even further. Okay, so we can see that being more aggressive is actually gonna help them out in the long run in terms of longevity, making sure their assets outpace inflation and other items like that. Um, really quickly, I want to see on uh, right here. Yeah, so this is an example of, of what happens just on average returns. They're going to end up with more money at the end of life. Based on the previous 50 years of returns, there's even bigger gaps. So you can see here that the that being aggressive on the tail end actually jolts their uh, net worth much, much higher, leaving their three daughters, which remember they do have three daughters, leaving them with potentially a lot more money in terms of inheritance. So that's number one. We've increased their stock allocation. Let's keep going here. Um, what happens if we evaluate their distribution sequence? So most of the time uh, people do pro rata, which is an equal distribution amount or equal percentage coming from um, their different sources of income, such as IRA, Roth IRA, brokerage account, things like that. Let's take a look really quickly and see if we can improve that at all and say, what happens if we change it? So if we take a look at their tax uh, rates overall, what we can see is there's, there's no taxes here on the front end based on their proposed plan. Remember, we're delaying their benefits until 67. Uh, and the reason that we have a jump in the tax rate before 67 is right now the system is thinking that we're gonna take from all of our cash or our brokerage accounts first, which is gonna be no taxes pretty much because uh, all of our capital gains, if we have any, those are gonna be at that 0% capital gain rate. And then once we uh, diminish or deplete those account types, we're gonna start pulling on the IRAs second, and that's where the taxes come into play here at 65 and beyond. So what we've got here is we've got this, this gap, if you will, and what we call gap years. This is our chance to perhaps do some uh, tax planning or Roth conversions and kind of saying, hey, what can we do to minimize taxes? Now. Whenever we get to this point, we can see there's a slight increase. Now it's pretty slight, not very big, but that's for RMDs kicking in whenever they get to 75. So their RMDs are gonna kick in here and it's gonna be increasing over time since their accounts are likely gonna be increasing, but also that percentage that they must distribute from their accounts will also be going up. And then here you see a large jump, which is uh, whenever uh, they go from married filing jointly, when Bob passes away, Sue will now have to file as a single filer, yet her RMDs will still have to be the same amount. So this is what we call the widow's tax trap. This is whenever uh, they're paying as uh, joint filers and then all of a sudden she now has to pay on the same amount of income she's gotta pay as a single filer. So that tax jump is for her there. So what can we do to help, I guess, maybe lower taxes? Or is there a way to benefit here? Let's see if we do any Roth conversions up to the 10% bracket. We'll fill up that little green sliver. It helps us out by a pretty good bit there. Let's keep going here to 12%. And we see the green portion here, that's Roth conversions going from the tax deferred into that Roth account. And it actually is very beneficial. It looks like long-term. And you can see the dark blue shade versus the light blue. The light blue here, this is the unchanged, meaning no conversions. And then the dark blue is uh, with the conversions, their tax rates are obviously gonna be much lower uh, in the future. 
And then let's go to 22. I bet it doesn't. Actually, it's not too bad. It's more or less the same. So they could do a Roth conversions all the way up to that 22% bracket. Um, and again, in 2026, that bracket's going up to 25%, as you can see notated right here. But even with that, they can see that, hey, this is still might be a, a very good option, meaning at the end of age 73, they're going to have no tax deferred uh, assets, meaning no RMDs, which means all things will go to their kids, their three daughters one day will go tax free and any distributions they have in the future will also be tax free, which makes their future social security income also tax free. So all of that to say, that's where that $2.5 million is coming in is by doing conversions, there's a huge benefit for them. So let's see what, what this changes here. Let's just leave this at 22%. I want to go back to the retirement tab and I want to see if we add this into the overall mix of the plan and we say, let's do the distribution strategy, the proposal, we're hit refresh, went from 75% to 75%. So what happens here is their, their chance of success is not necessarily going up or down. It's not really moving a whole lot based on the Roth conversions, but what we can see is perhaps tax savings is going to be beneficial. So what I want to do is I want to evaluate what are the benefits of those Roth conversions if they do them, all things else equal. Let's see what happens if they uh, don't do conversions, meaning the current plan, and then we do some conversions. And I want to show you one potential pitfall here. So let's look at their tax payments. You can see the first couple of years by doing no, no conversions, living off of the taxable accounts first, and then um, some Social Security coming in at, uh, at 62, right? So that's the current plan. Their tax payment, let's download this. We can pull this here. Let's see what their total taxes would be over the rest of their life it would sue at passing away at 95 and, and Bob at 90 equals sum that to there. First few years, no taxes. But there's their total tax liability over the rest of their life, given all of these different assumptions. Obviously, it's going to be probably different than that, um, but we want to just kind of go with what we have here. Okay, now let's go to the proposed plan, which includes delaying Social Security until uh, 60 um, until 67, and then we also are doing Roth conversions. So our taxes are obviously much higher here <laughs> in the first few years because of those conversions, but on the back end, we're doing the, we have no taxes here if we fill up that 22 or 25% tax bracket. So what I'm curious about is, where's that $2.5 million benefit come in? Does it come in on the tax saving side? Let's see here. We're gonna open this, all right. Now we can total this up, equals sum. And now let's see what the total tax bill is going to be there if we do it that way. Wow. <laughs> Look at that. So no conversions. Okay. Social Security uh, at 62. Social Security at 67 with conversions. And the purpose of that is that 67, that five-year gap of not taking Social Security, allows them to convert more within that 22% or 25% tax bracket. Because once we add in conversions, part of your Social Security could become taxable or would become taxable. And so that takes up room there in those, those tax brackets, eliminating or reducing how much you can actually convert. So you kind of have to do these things together. If you're going to do Roth conversions, oftentimes it is beneficial to delay Social Security. And so if you take your Social Security at 62 and you're trying to do Roth conversions, it kind of, you, number one, you're reducing your Social Security benefit, but then also you're reducing the potential or benefits of those Roth conversions. So what we can see is if they decide to pay all their taxes on all their $1.5 million of tax deferred money, in these first, we'll call it 10 to 12 years, they're gonna have no taxes for the rest of their life, even though they're still receiving great social security benefits. They're still receiving you know, $60,000, $70,000 a year in social security benefits at this point and beyond, but they're not paying any tax on it because it's their only source of income. So what we can see is the difference here. Let's do really quick, it's $600,000 or so. That minus that. So by doing the Roth conversions, they're saving over 500, just under $600,000 in taxes over the rest of their life. Now, what that means is, is they're not paying the taxes, but also their kids are not paying taxes if they receive or inherit those Roth IRAs. Now they have to distribute that by the end of that 10th, 10th year based on the SECURE Act, but they're not having to pay taxes on those distributions. Now, opposite of that is if they receive those tax deferred accounts, they're gonna have to distribute that over that 10 year period and they're gonna be paying income taxes. So the benefit for them as someone who's inheriting those assets is much greater to receive the Roth accounts rather than the tax deferred accounts. Now, one of the thing I wanted to look at here is what happens if, uh, Bob passes away at 75. We evaluated this in the previous uh, video, part one on Social Security. What was the benefit or drawback of that there based on him passing away early? 
So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave everything else the same. I'm gonna change his date of uh, death from 90 to 75, okay? I'm gonna hit refresh, okay? And now let's look at the tax liability um, if we don't do conversions, okay? So if we don't do any conversions and he passes away at 75, I wanna see uh, what the impact is of this. Tax, download. So now we can add this one in. We'll total this up. So we've got them um, delaying their social security benefits, okay, until 67. The reason there's some taxes here is because before 67, they're gonna have uh, distributions from their IRAs to live on. They're depleting their brokerage and cash accounts in these years, and they're gonna have to start taking from those IRAs uh, here before Social Security kicks in. Now, what you can see is there are some years with no taxes because of tax gain harvesting at 0% and, uh, and really no other taxable income. By not doing conversions in these years, the difference is, is let's say that, that Bob, he passed away at 75. The widow's tax trap is then in play if Sue lives to 95 for all of these years, right? So now ever, every time after, every year after 75, she's paying taxes as a single filer, which is the widow's tax trap. So what you can see is by, by not doing conversions, we're looking at is she's gonna pay $1.5 million in taxes or they're gonna pay in total taxes over the rest of her life. If she lives to 95, $1.5 million in taxes. Now with conversions, okay, he lives to 90, 95, okay? Let's do it this way. So that's that. That's how much they would have there if, if they both live to the appropriate ages or the ages we expect them to live. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, we're gonna go back here and we're gonna, now we're gonna compare apples to apples on the conversion side. Okay, we're gonna say distribution proposal, Annie's at 75, passing away at 75, everything else is the same. So we've got that updated. We're gonna go here. We're gonna look at the summary. We're gonna look at tax payment. We're gonna get this copied over. All right, this is gonna be the exact same as before. So even with him passing away early, all of it's already gone. There's no, there's no uh, issues with the widow's tax trap because there's nothing left to pay in terms of distributions on RMDs. So you can see is it actually is beneficial on all sides. If he lives to 90, it's still the same benefit because they're, they're reducing the taxes all the way down. There's no, there's no benefit uh, outside of that. So let's see here. So even if he passes away at 75, there's no assets to distribute, meaning RMDs for her, compared to is if they don't do the conversions and he still passes away at 75, she's now gotta take all these RMDs as a single tax filer. And look, she's paying upwards $100,000 per year in taxes potentially. At, in her in her early 90s. And so if we do the conversions, we eliminate those tax deferred accounts entirely. And even if he passes away early, it's that much more benefit, right? If they don't do the conversions and the widow's tax trap kicks in, they're gonna be paying tons of taxes throughout the rest of their life. So um, by doing this, they're gonna benefit greatly, okay? They're gonna be greatly from doing Roth conversions, which is where that two and a half million dollars of potential benefit comes in. And even if we think about their three daughters receiving inheritance one day, if they don't spend all their money, all of that inheritance would be tax-free. So, and on top of that too, is they don't have to ever worry about IRMA. They don't have to worry about taxation on their social security. So it all still, like it benefits them so much if they can do these Roth conversions and plan it out correctly. So. Let's kind of wrap this up and bring it back to their overall plan here. If we do all of that, um, if we go from where we were taking it at 62, being a 60-40 portfolio, um, no Roth conversions, $7,500 a month of living expenses, right? We're at 63% probabilities of success. We've increased that to 78%. Now, what we can do even more is we could probably say, what happens if we just reduce this down to 7,000 in terms of their spending monthly by $500? we're getting into like, there's there's really no chance of failure range. Um, because here's the deal, again, I talk about this all the time, but if we ever get into that 15% left over that's right here, uh, the chance of failure, we're gonna make adjustments. That's the point of having an ongoing plan or ongoing uh, guide, someone to monitor and help you navigate all the decisions is what happens if the market's down 30%? Well, that's what's bringing in that 15% chance of failure, right? So we have to know what we're gonna do when that happens. Perhaps that means more conversions when the market's down, or perhaps it means reducing our living expenses for a, a particular period of time. 
But regardless, we're getting, we've made a ton of improvements to their overall plan, and we can see this in action. That's the key is like, here's the decision making, here's what I'm thinking and the processes I'm going through. So hopefully this helps you uh, understand and kind of see the things that you should be evaluating in your retirement plan uh, and kind of all the different considerations to factor in. The biggest one for them is when do I take Social Security and what happens if Bob passes away early? Uh, and so the taxation on that would be huge if they don't do the conversion. So we're probably gonna look at increasing their overall investment allocation towards stocks. And they're also gonna be doing Roth conversions, delaying that Social Security to 67 and, um, and things like that. So hopefully this is helpful for you. If it is, please leave a comment below. I'd love to hear more about uh, different ideas or case study ideas you'd love to see more about. Um, I'd love to hear from you. If you would subscribe, that way you can see more videos like this one. Other than that, I hope you have a great day and thank you for tuning in.